Johnny made everything work. That show was Johnny. It started in my childhood. I was a little spindly kid in a, a Western community of all cowboys, and the major point in life for them was to wait for Saturday night, get drunk, and go out and get in a fight with your best friend. I know because they used to come to my dad to get patched up afterwards, <laughs> four o'clock in the morning. I wanted to be, you know, uh, I wanted a place to fit in, and uh, so I went to one rodeo, and my mother made me a red satin shirt, cowboy shirt to wear. And uh, I think that kind of got me started. But, you know, truthfully, when I was a little kid, I was really pretty, um, oh, how do you say it? I, I was the town character. And curse words were high on my list of things to say. And um, I was extremely irreverent at all times. And uh, always looking for a chance to be the, the clown and all of that. And that, that kind of stayed with me. And so at one point, Skitch Henderson started kind of pulling me out of the band to, just to do stuff, you know. And I was his assistant leader on a, a great program we had on uh, NBC radio. And uh, all that stuff kind of set me up for when Johnny took over the show. He was a great admirer of uh, Jack Benny, and he liked the idea of uh, the way Jack Benny had a, a family, you know. Uh, Dennis uh, O'Day, was it? The, the, Dennis Day. The, well, he's Irish. I put in an O there. Dennis O'Day singing, uh, you know, Phil Harris. And um, so he saw an opportunity to pull that out of us, different people, you know, guys in the band and myself. And... It, it, I think it worked, and Johnny made it work. Johnny made everything work. That show was Johnny from the get-go. Well, <clears throat> I tell you, it takes a while to learn how to read a guy like that because if you try to jump in there with the saver and uh, he's not in the mood for it, that's not a good thing. And you really have to be judicious about what you put your two cents worth in. And the other thing you got to be very careful about is putting in something that steps on a line or reveals a line that's coming up, you know. You kill his joke for him. These things are bad. <laughs> but I think that, you know, all of us spending a certain amount of time together that was quite considerable, you learn those things. Johnny's extremely bright and, and very observant, so it wasn't difficult for him to be paying attention to the band when, at a moment when we're over there playing and thinking, nobody's listening to us, nobody's paying any attention. And then I get a little note from Freddie DeCorda that, that says, Johnny said, don't ever play that song again as long as you live. So I collected all the parts, <clears throat> and I took them out to his parking spot, and I, I built a beautiful bonfire right behind his Corvette and set that sucker on fire, and I said, well, you won't have to worry about hearing that song again. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the way it went. He, he was very good about leaving us alone, unless we played a tune or a style of tune that he got tired of. And when you do five days a week, you know, 52 weeks a year, you're going to be bound to play something a couple of times too many that he doesn't care for. And uh, he was not above letting us know, but always in a very nice way. Johnny would never embarrass anybody in a public way if he could avoid it. People that come on that show to, to host or fill in for Johnny, first of all, they're petrified, and they don't have the talent that he does. And, uh, you know, so they're going by this lead sheet that was very sketchy. 
and trying to find something to go by there, Johnny went by what happened. You know, we had, a, we had things all figured out, but then uh, after the first commercial, we come back from, from, uh, from the, you know, the stand up in the beginning of the show, not a long commercial, then Johnny and Ed are sitting there. And it always started off with a little, a little banter back and forth about the day or something. And I've seen them take that and go for 15 minutes with it, driving everybody on the network crazy, trying to get it the next commercial in. But uh, they, those were some of the best moments in the show when Johnny and Ed just absolutely were winging it. And, and he majored in logic in college. So he could really handle himself in a verbal confrontation. In fact, he would tell you, okay, you want to argue about it? You pick the side you want. And he'd take the other side and just demolish you. But um, no, Johnny was uh, far more uh, esoteric and bright than he ever let on. He knew, he knew what, what played well in the Midwest because he was from the Midwest, always. As sophisticated and bright as he was, he, he was always that nice guy from Nebraska. Sure, uh, especially with Euchre, because after the show was over, uh, maybe Euchre's wife doesn't want to hear this, but this might also come as good news. Euchre would hang around with the, the, the crew backstage. You know, the stage hands and all of that, they'd bring out the, the party stuff, and uh, a party could really go on for quite a long while. Well, some of the musicians stayed, and uh, some of the guys in the band had real good friendships with Euchre, and so they loved him, and they wanted him to do well, so when he, when he was really cooking, they get, yeah, you give it to him, baby. And, uh, <laughs> You know, and, and then people that were frequent guests like that, you could relate to more easily. I think after enough time passed by, yeah, if you paid attention, you could tell, especially if they'd said something that really put them off, you know, something that they shouldn't have said, or if they were a little bit ripped, you know, got into the sauce a little bit too much, thinking, ah, oh, that'll make me looser. And, um, but Johnny never, ever, I don't think, let the audience know that it wasn't going really well. He would do everything he could to save a guest and to keep the show high class. I think that, that's the word that describes Johnny better than anything else is class. He was a classy man, and he didn't like to do things that were not high class, like profanity, and uh, you know, he just wouldn't go there. He said, because once you do, you're stuck there. You can't get out. And it's, a, it's a, an unfortunate way to keep a career going. Yeah, no two ways about it. Now, it was one thing when the show ended, everybody was still alive, you know. And then when Johnny passed away, boy, it was, uh, hmm. wasn't great. I think he'd like to be remembered as a guy who showed up on time and was always prepared and always gave the best he had to give and sometimes under difficult circumstances. He would pull the best out of a guest. He listened to what they had to say, tried to make them look good, and he never let anything uh, push him off balance. He always, he was like Fred Astaire dancing. He was always in motion but in perfect balance and nothing but class. That, to me, that's the one word that describes Johnny. First of all, he took a, a position on television that didn't necessarily mean you were going to be a superstar. Being a, a talk show host doesn't make you a superstar. And I will never forget the night 
after I'd been with Johnny for some time and was doing concerts with him, we were playing in Baltimore in a great big, uh, they fixed a, an arena into a, a, in, like a theater in the round. I came out, did my thing, and somebody else did something, and somebody else. And then we played the theme song. And Johnny was way back in the arena. He was coming down these steps onto the floor of the arena, and the lights caught him. And <clears throat> as he was walking toward the stage, the thought occurred to me. I mean, it wasn't a thought. It was a reality. I said, holy God, this guy's a superstar. He is a super star, not just one of the good talk show hosts. And he made something out of that job and that show that no one else ever did or ever will. <laughs>